the key to that is to use the St. Louis cut, which is what that is. Mm -hmm. Because the St. Louis cut has enough fat that where you can cook it to make it that tender, but it's, it'll stay moist. If you do a baby back, you have to be much more delicate with it, mm -hmm. right? It cooks faster, it's much, it's much more tender, but depending on what kind of baby back you have, it can dry out because that's a loin, that's a loin rib, right? And if you know anything about loin, you know where, where you've seen the, the loin, loin roll, it can, I mean, it can be very, very dry, right? So you have to be very careful with how you do that, man. And that, that's that 10,000 hours coming in right there. So this if you, week, if you, if you this week, <laughs> so, so I've done 27 already since yesterday. <laughs> yesterday. Wait, so 27 ribs, 27 racks, racks since, since yesterday. yesterday. Yeah. Wow. Jeez. Yeah. So <laughs> a few cases, <laughs> maybe one, or, one or two. Oh man, it's just it's funny, and it's. I mean, I tell folks all the time, you got to be crazy because that's the only way you can do this stuff do it right like I take a lot of pride in what we do because you know I, I really believe in quality barbecue it sounds crazy and weird some folks or whatever but I just I, I can't the thought of somebody boiling or baking it's just <laughs> I want to go punch him right well, it's, it sounds throat. it sounds almost like you care more about the product than the dollar because um, you, you, I mean, you talk about it like an art form almost. It is an it's, art. It's an art form it, it, it that you're then much, providing to people. It very much is people. an art. Um, let me not make that <laughs> assertion uh, because we have to stay solvent. And, oh, right. Uh, you know, I don't necessarily need to get rich. If mm. I do, that's great. But I have a lot of fun watching folks eat and enjoy real barbecue for the first time. Like, I can't tell you how many people have come to my uh, my shop over at Millennial Park and said, barbecue nachos, what is that? And so I take a deep breath and I go through this process of telling them what barbecue nachos is. And it usually ends up with something like, have you ever gotten nachos at a Mexican restaurant? Mm -hmm. like, well, yeah, well, what do you have on there? And they start naming the stuff and I'm like, okay, take that, all of that. And instead of the ground meat you're used to getting, think about good smoked pulled pork. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. I said, look, let me let you try it. So I'll give them a sample. And they've never tasted good chili queso with uh, smoked pork. And they're like, wow, I've never, this is awesome. Da, 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 da. What's also been interesting for me is to understand some of the, ba the Baton Rouge palate. So most folks ask for barbecue sauce on their nachos. That's a new one for me. I accommodate folks as they wish, you know. So what would you normally put on nachos? Uh, for me, um, I'd have my queso uh, flavored with uh, hatch green chilies, uh, a little garlic powder, a little onion powder, black pepper. Um, and um, from there, uh, we'd have uh, sour cream, a little guac, uh, green, green onions. He, 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 he walked by with the hands right yeah, he's going for seconds. Oh, yeah. Green onions and uh, tomatoes and black olives. Okay. A little sour cream, if I didn't say that already. Yeah. And then drizzle it with the barbecue sauce for no. everybody. No, not me. But, <laughs> for, but, but for those that do, absolutely. Absolutely. Oh. Good stuff, hey? Man. Holy crap. <laughs> There's more where that came from. Man, so uh, for those listening already, we've been talking about food for the last few minutes here with Carlos from Memphis Mac, um, and I'm excited. We've been talking for a while now just about barbecue and the process that he goes with it and his, his theory behind the art form that is barbecue. So for those that aren't aware or even heard of Memphis Mac, what is Memphis Mac and where are you? Okay, so Memphis Mac is a local startup. Uh, we've been in, in business uh, since February of this year. Um, closed down temporarily as a result of COVID for about five weeks. And during that time, uh, we did uh, Saturday uh, bulk orders for customers. And we did um, uh, shipping across across the country uh, to survive. 
Uh, we've since reopened at uh, our first location over uh, in the industrial corridor right off Chippewa at the corner of Larkspur and Chippewa, right across from the south gates of Exxon. And we are in the process of opening up our second location at Millennial Park on Florida Boulevard, uh, diagonally across from uh, Baton Rouge General. And so we're there now doing pop-ups every day uh, with hopes of our container being finished within the next week or so okay. to get us out of the element. <laughs> so pretty soon you'll be in your container. Yes, 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 yes. Fingers crossed. Fingers right. Crossed. And Millennial Park is... For those that don't know, what is Millennial Park to you? Yeah, so Millennial Park um, is what, well, for me, it's it's uh, where I actually go and practice my craft, but it's becoming a destination here in Baton Rouge. Uh, when I came to Baton Rouge in 1999, I would have loved to have had a Millennial Park, uh, but that area was uh, in some ways very blighted and uh, underdeveloped uh, at the time. Uh, right. It's since... Um, been uh, developed by Mr. Curtis Jackson and his son, Cameron Jackson. Mm -hmm. uh, their family has owned that property for some time. And um, so I was, I was telling you, Curtis and his wife and I, we were all in business school at LSU about 20 <laughs> years ago. So we've kind of come full circle. Right. But uh, I really see um, the activities and uh, the artwork that's coming up over there as – uh, as a catalyst for economic development in the community, as well as, again, a destination for um, engaging in the community uh, beyond some of the traditional things that we've always done here, football games. And, right, uh, uh, right. Getting, and I looked at some of the pictures of the concepts and everything yeah. that's happening, and it's, it is almost like one of the best COVID-friendly oh, awesome. eating arrangements. Oh, absolutely. Because all the eating is all the seating's outdoors. That's right. And all the tables are well within six That's feet right. apart. And so That's it's right. they they've almost kind of said, Hey, what can we do during COVID? And I have no idea if this was his Cameron's original their original intention. And when I have him on, we'll talk about it. Sure. But yeah, yeah I, I think I can speak for him and say it was not their original intention because this this was actually conceived uh, <laughs> a couple of years ago mm -hmm. before you know COVID came about. But it's been an awesome um, luck, uh, lucky charm to fall into uh, as a result of um, you know some of the apprehensions that people have about going and eating out, mm -hmm. right? So uh, folks have been able to come there if they don't want to stay, that's fine, right? Uh, but it, it is it's it's an open air area area and um, you know we have right now three restaurants there. We've got Jamaica Royal. Okay. We've got um, Jive Turkey, which is uh, Cameron's place, Cameron and Curtis's place. Mm -hmm. And then we've got Memphis Mac Barbecue. Right. Yeah. And so I think once once the containers are finished, uh, the next phase, we're gonna, there's going to be a pizza and daiquiri container. Um, we just had a 40-foot container de de delivered that's being um, developed as uh, the local bar. Okay. And um, we've got a couple of other containers uh, that are going to be uh, a salad and fresh, uh, fresh uh, vegetable uh, right. place. And then another one that's going to be um, a bakery or something. So you're going to get like a full circle. You yeah, have everything like, there. You know, the, 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 the mindset is for you to be able to go there and to, to shop at, you know, one of a number of places to get your food you know you don't have to yeah. just go to one right and you have the option like you know we were talking like with carl for his you know going his wife's going the vegan route she had right. options to not he can go get Absolutely. his pork and enjoy some memphis mac ribs yeah and then she can can go have whatever else now, and everybody else can do the same absolutely now full disclosure she may be able to get some memphis mac smoked vegan food too Ooh, so do tell yes well <laughs> i i live in pasadena um Twice. I lived there when I was an internal auditor, mm -hmm. um, worked for Avery Dennison, and then I'm, I lived there a couple of years ago when I was teaching at USC. Um, and so, um, you know, California is full of folks that don't like me. Right. And, uh, you know, one of my students actually admonished me because in class, m most of my examples were examples about business and barbecue. And so I started talking about this one day. And one of my one of my best students she came up to me. She said, "Dr. Thomas, you know, hey, I 
just want you to know that I really think you need to rethink, you know, the consumption of animals. I'm, you know, I'm a member of PETA and so on and so forth. Now, country come to town, mm -hmm. I'm saying to myself, what? <laughs> but then I have to remember, you're in Southern California. Right. You're at the University of Southern California. Ergo, you're probably going to meet some folks that don't eat meat. So, right. you know, consider your audience. Yeah, and you had to adapt to that. Yeah, yeah, it was interesting. So you said teaching. Yeah. Um, I want to back up a little bit because as we've got some delicious barbecue in front of us and Carl enjoyed it, you weren't always doing barbecue. No, no, So no. what? let's back up to, you know, you said you were an internal auditor. Let's let's start there. Or does the story begin back when you were a little kid, maybe? How, <laughs> as far as teaching or cooking or what? In general. What kind of a kid were you? Uh, gregarious, um, ostentatious. Not ostentatious. Gregarious. Um, bombastic. And uh, I was a good kid. Good kid. <laughs> that, as good as kids can be. That's right. Who knew how... You knew what to say mm -hmm. and knew how to get over and to be able to go out and do the dirt that I want to do, which my brother and sister will tell you. They weren't as savvy as out. They actually did theirs in the open and I just did mine behind closed doors. Um, I was raised by my mom and my grandparents. My father was killed. He was a victim of gun violence when he was in college. Uh, he, he and my mom met during the military, during Vietnam. And um, after his death, my mother moved back to Tennessee and went to school, finished up, and we uh, stayed with my grandparents um, after she graduated and uh, uh, stayed with them until I was, till she was remarried, uh, which was when I was 16, moved to Memphis and um, went to high school there at Craigmont and um, went on to Vanderbilt for uh, undergrad and to, uh, to play football. Had the dubious distinction of beating LSU uh, and scoring two touchdowns in that game in 1990. Um, and then went on to grad school uh, at Temple and then Memphis State later on. Uh, went to Tennessee State to do my first doctorate. Got hired to come to LSU mm -hmm. uh, to work uh, as the academic advisor for the football team and to teach. And um, I did my master's at, at – uh, or so, the business school, right. and went off and worked as an internal <clears throat> auditor for Avery Dennison. Came back to do my doctorate in uh, information systems at LSU and did that. And um, went and taught at Southern for 11 years. And uh, when I was at LSU, I was teaching also in ISDS, as well as uh, teaching African American studies courses. Okay. And uh, yeah, so that's... Kinda. So the connection from teaching to barbecue, how do we how do we get there? So barbecue is, I mean, in South Louisiana, you know, we boil crawfish and right. seafood, right? Right. In Memphis, you listen to blues and you smoke meat, man. Like it, <laughs> that's Saturday afternoon for us, uh -huh. you know, going out, getting a shoulder. And I say a shoulder, I'm talking about from here all the way down to the hock, right? So... Not this stuff that's already not cut so, up that's, that's pre-cut and everything. Yeah, nah, 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 nah. Shit, you can take the whole thing. You get everything except the hoof. And, um, you know, you cook that sucker, you smoke it, um, and you tend it, as we say. Mm -hmm. um, and what does tend mean? Tend means you, you're there making sure that fire is hot enough. There, there are no thermometers. There's no none of that shit. You actually are there looking at the fire, you're looking at the smoke, and you're determining how much smoke is actually getting on there and what kind of smoke. So if it's a white smoke, that's grease, which can be flavorful. But what you want is a gray and, and blue smoke, which that's going to be good, clean smoke coming from whatever wood you're using to smoke, man. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you don't want the velocity to be too high too fast you want you want it, it should be easing out which means that you've got a good low fire and you're getting a lot of combustion on that meat so it's a low smoke it's a low smoke so you can get it through and through it, and it's, not it's, it's not a, a rushed smoke. process it shouldn't be okay it's best at a low smoke now when you get into the business of it mm -hmm. right and you're looking at 
a day's uh, activities, right? So you may right. have your local, I mean, rather your regular lunch hour that you got to prepare for. Mm -hmm. But then, say, Turner Industries or Exxon calls and says, hey, we want 50 plates of ribs and chicken, so on and so forth, da 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 you got to discern at that point, okay, what do I have that's cooked? What else do I need to cook? And how much time do I need to prepare it, right? Right. So at our Larkspur location, you know, we're up every morning, five, five o'clock, smoking. We have approximately five hours to cook something new, okay? So it, it takes you five hours to cook a new... To, to, to cook something new. Now, the question is, is it done? So, if we have, if we don't have enough brisket on hand, mm -hmm. if you take a hit, you say, hey guys, we can't meet that. Can we offer something else? Brisket, as you know, is... It takes a long time. It, it, if you're doing it right, mm -hmm. right? Uh, you shouldn't have to do, do this when you're eating brisket. Brisket should be something that should be as tender as ground beef if you're cooking it the right way. Um, but you can't do that in five hours. You can get enough smoke on it in five hours, but you don't want to serve that, right? It's right. not tender the way it needs to be. Um, you can get away with pulled pork. If it's sliced thinly, mm -hmm. I say thinly, about this thin, and you actually know how to, how to work the fire to get enough heat on it after you smoke it. Chicken, you're fine. Um, baby back ribs, you're fine. Spare ribs, depends on how big they are. Right, so five hours, you're pushing it. Sausage, yeah, you're good. You're good on that. Right. Um, so it really depends on what it is that you're trying trying to uh, to get out there. Lamb yeah. chops, you're fine. <clears throat> so, like from a, a business standpoint, how do you kind of plan your day, knowing you got something that could take up to eight, ten hours to cook? How do you, how do you judge, or do you just cook and you run out when you run out? Well, it's a little bit of both, right? So um, that IS degree was coupled with a DS, the decision sciences, right? Mm -hmm. So we had to learn stats. We had to learn probability, so on and so forth. We are just not getting to the point where we have enough data to start to project, okay, on Thursdays, this is what our demand looks like over the last four or five months. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and successive days um, do the same sort of analysis. So we actually use some linear programming um, techniques to actually do projections for what we'll need for that day. And we also think about what are the exogenous variables that are impacting our marketplace. So Exxon just laid off, just went through another round of layoffs. Mm -hmm. The chances of us having the same volume coming through our doors is pretty low. Right, right? with the layoffs, yeah. And so we need to think about, okay, what should we be making given that this has occurred? And so we, we may do something like a 20% drop in our production just to not have you know, too much on hand. Um, and you know, if we're wrong, we just take the hit and we come back and, and, and modify. So it really is a trial and error sort of scenario, but just like you would with any sort of forecast, you're, you're taking multiple um, forecasting agents in, including you know, your own perception and making a, a judgment on what you should actually cook for that day. Yeah, so it's, mm -hmm. I did not realize how much statistics and math oh, went into that side. Oh, I thought it was, oh, oh we do this every now and again. Let's, let's, see, let's try a little bit more. So I used to have a saying uh, when I used to teach my classes, my quantitative analysis classes at Southern. So there's two types of businesses. Mm -hmm. You have a business and you have a business. So a business... It's just out there winging it, saying, hey, I think they like this. <laughs> no market research or nothing, but a business is actually trying to utilize as much data as it can use to actually make informed decisions, right? And so we mm -hmm. like to think that uh, we, uh, we, we appear to be a business, but our back office operations are definitely full of business operations. Right, there's a whole other side yeah. that people see on the on the front side. They see delicious barbecue oh, and they enjoy delicious barbecue, right. but they don't know you're back there crunching the numbers Got to. to figure out what you need to cook yeah. for the next week, two uh, week, two weeks, and project it on out. Absolutely, just like today when I left Millennial Park, I had to go put three briskets on. 
um, because um, we've got quite a bit of inquiry over at Millennial Park for brisket and brisket sandwiches and whatever. So I had to go get that process started, man. So they'll cook all night and we'll come up in the morning and wrap them and finish them off. And by 1130, they'll be ready to go. I love it. Yeah. So going from the decision science and the ISDS majors and all these degrees, I mean, very, very well educated. What was the decision to stop the teaching and go into barbecuing? So, yeah, I have way too much education, way too much education, overeducated. Um, and uh, that's a function of me just getting bored easily and me learning and liking to learn. Um, 20 years of teaching is a long time. Yeah. If you do it the right way and if you're in, in, involved um, the way that I was, and I loved it, don't get me wrong, but the profession has changed significantly. Uh, you know, if I didn't do well in the class, I took my lumps and came back and tried again. Uh, I've seen way too much coddling. And, you know, when I was at USC, there was a, um, um, there was a, uh, uh, an acronym. Well, they said that USC was an acronym for <laughs> University of Spoiled Children. And ironically, you know, I saw some of that um, firsthand. But, you know, I had, I, on this other side, I had some, some students that were um, you know, first generation, college, uh, community college transfers. But I, I, did see, I did see quite a bit of that, man. And, um, you know, I just, it, it runs course in my life. Now, I, I may go back to academia. I don't know. Uh, right now, I'm loving smoking meat. Yeah. And feeding the people, as I say. Yeah, it brings you that that joy that mm -hmm. <clears throat> you can't, I mean, you wake up at 5 a.m. and you go and you smoke your meat and then you right. go on with your day. Right. And it's just, I know I enjoy smoking meat, oh, yeah. but I'm not quite quite at that level. Oh, you're good. Man. I use a little, little propane good. stand up smoker <laughs> and put, my, put, put my wood chips in the bottom. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, that's how I do my smoking. Hey, it's some good, you can do some good meat that way. Man. Oh, yeah. I'm telling you. Oh, yeah. You know, I don't, don't, it, Man, look, the only difference between me and someone else is that I'm crazy enough to do this shit every day. Right? <laughs> That's it, man. I think if you ask most men, especially during COVID, yeah. what they would want yeah. to do, yeah. they'd want to smoke some meat. Look, I can tell you, it's again, with every crisis, there's an opportunity. And so mm -hmm. we started selling in bulk and we, we expanded our market because not everybody could get over there uh, to, to our Larkspur location. Um, uh, during the week because it's you know it's lunchtime right right so we we man we started having folks coming in from greensburg and gonzalez and you know, i heard about you young know, thank you come in, they try they get a whole brisket or a slab of ribs or you know whatever man and so um you know it, it was a great opportunity for us to to actually tap into a whole whole other market that you know, working five days a week, we just didn't, we didn't even think about it, man. Right. And ha so how do you go about shipping barbecue? I mean, are you shipping it hot? Or what's, no, 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 how, no, no. How, how is, what, what are you shipping, I yeah, guess? Yeah, so um, we're shipping uh, ribs, chicken, brisket, pulled pork, uh, shrimp and grits, sides. We're shrimping, shrimping. <laughs> shrimp. We're shipping anything <laughs> that we can freeze and, and ship via... Uh, via dry ice. Okay. So, um, sausage. Uh, and I, I have a shipment that I didn't get out today, which one of my good childhood friends is going to beat me up about. But, um, you know, we ship uh, via dry ice, with dry ice via uh, UPS. And, uh, you know, it's, it's been good for us, man. It's definitely been... Um, a revenue stream that we never would have thought about when we right. started. Well, it's the COVID kind of forced a lot of people oh, to sure. rethink their business model Absolutely. in more ways than one. Yeah. You know, you've got bars that are now going and getting a food license mm -hmm. and serving hot food mm -hmm. from a local restaurant Absolutely. just so they can open their doors. Right. And it, like for you, you said y'all were closed for a couple months and then mm -hmm. only on Saturdays you would do, sh you would start shipping stuff out. You can't, you can't close the doors and give up when the no, crisis happens. I, I don't I don't think I mean you can but you know I it, 
It's your baby. It's, if you're the business, yeah. it's your baby. I mean, you want to. If you can you afford it. Adapt. Some right. folks only have you know a week's worth of operating right. in the bank, so it just didn't make sense for them to 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 go and you know work on fumes. But no, I'm with you. Like for for me, luckily we only had like five weeks in, and we made money, and uh, we were able to actually. Um, take advantage of the, the mayor's Keep Baton Rouge Serving program. So we had folks buying um, gift certificates and uh, that gave us a revenue stream. And so just very fortunate in general, you know. Right. Um, we, were, we, haven't been op- we hadn't been open long enough to get any PPP money. And so mm-hmm. it was really on the revenue we had actually accrued and uh, our reserves that we were able to stay alive, man. And just thinking about, okay, so what does the future look like? So like now we're only open four days a week. We're not open on Mondays. Mondays are typically slow in that area. And so it just made sense for us to say, okay, we need to incur the, the inventory costs or the labor cost. We'll do the four days a week and go from there. And you know, it's been, we've been successful thus far. Yeah, and you've got your, your crew that's probably appreciative of not having to work Absolutely. every single day. Absolutely. They're, because they're, it's, they're long hours. Very. They're, I mean, for to Very. smoke meat, you got to start, like you said, oh, at 5 a.m., yeah. but then once y'all close at the end of the day, you got to start prepping for the next day. A- absolutely. And so it's exactly just, right. it's not a normal nine to five, no, eight hour no, no, shift. No. It's, no, you're going to show up and we're going to work until we're done. Yeah. And then we're going to go home yeah, and yeah. repeat. You're going to work the entire time. That's for sure. Right. Yeah. And you, you have to now to stay afloat mm-hmm. and moving into a second location. How do you go about determining when you're ready? Because I hear the second one is always the hardest to open. Opening three, four, and 400 is easy. It's going from one to two can be one of the most challenging steps. So um, they say the, 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 the mark of a true scholar is when you don't know what you don't know. And I don't know. What I can tell you is the last two weeks I've spent uh, looking at the market there, mm-hmm. doing pop-ups in the elements, <laughs> rain, hot. <laughs> 95 yeah, degrees oh that's why God. we're that's why so, we're inside the house today right want to give them some air yeah. conditioning <laughs> so i'm learning the market there and mm-hmm. i'm learning the cycles and what the demand looks like um and so this is kind of like a pretest that i'm doing just so when we open up i can say okay this is what our inventory is going to be because this is what sold and this is what didn't sell as i was talking to you before we got on air again i've just i've it's more, it's been astonishing to me to meet so many kids who say I don't eat pork, and I'm like, really? Right. Right. We have crackling and all kinds of shit here. You don't eat pork? Oh, I, I can kill for some crackling. Don't, don't get me started. <laughs> but they tend to be younger kids, right? Mm-hmm. So maybe that's something that you know it's it's in vogue now. I don't know, but I have to make sure I have an alternative for them because if that customer is interested in Memphis Mac, right? Shame on me for not having. Excuse me, a brisket sandwich or a barbecue hamburger yeah. or something to you know to to really meet their their needs at that point in time. That's a customer I could have for life if we treat them right. right? And it's giving them the having the diversity in the menu oh, yeah. that you're not just cooking one specific. You're not cooking one cut of meat. You're not cooking one animal. Right. You've got you know your chicken, your sausage, yeah, your yeah. pork, absolutely, and you've got a wide array of options that. If I come in and I really just want a sausage, you know, some smoked sausage, yeah. you're going to have that. Yeah, yeah. But then you've also got, you know, when Carl comes in and just says, give me a rack of ribs. Right. Absolutely. And the, the rub on that is you have to make sure that you have enough, but not too much too often. Right. Right, um, like so, the McRib going in and out. <laughs> you can't have it all the time. Right, no, no, can't have it all the time. That's right. You got to so, go have it, build up the hype. That, that's right. See the sales. As soon as you see that drop off, that's all right, right, we're done. Quit it. You know, pull it from the menu. You'll see me on Thursdays on social media. Social media, I, it's, we call that Thrips Day, not Thursday. Thrips Day. Thrips Day, right? That's when we run our rib special. Right. And running that rib special gets a lot of traffic in there. Out of traffic, which means that you have to forecast. Okay, mm-hmm. so over the last four months, what's our average number of servings that we do on our rib special? 
Yeah. Let's go from there, man. Right, and it's, it all goes back to the data. Where do we see the most coming in from when we do this? When we Absolutely. do X, what's going to happen? When we do Y, what's going to happen? Yeah. And it's, it, it's, it's amazing to, to have a conversation with you about barbecue being so tied to numbers. Well, I, it's just for whatever reason, it's fascinating yeah, to me. Sure, I mean, being man. a numbers guy, no, sure. It's you know, I see it in like a big, like a normal scale restaurant for staffing needs, but you're so it's so much to okay. How much do we need to start rubbing the night before and pre- prepping the night before for the next day, yeah. based upon what we're gonna do? And we're gonna throw in a special on social yeah. media that normally gets X number of hits. Sure, and it's sure. Knowledge of numbers is power. Your, your, your point of sale system becomes really the, the nervous system of your operations, right? Mm-hmm. You, I mean, even to the point of knowing, okay, so at what, what are the hours that we have the highest traffic through here? That allows you to start thinking about your staffing, right? Mm-hmm. Everybody would need to be there at the same time, right? Uh, and so it's been interesting to see my staff react to me saying, okay, well, I want you to come in here. And because when we first started, everyone just came at the same time. And, you know, they, many of them acted like they were doing something. And why not? <laughs> stay and stay so, busy or? Stay busy, look busy. That's right. Um, but they have come to the realization that, okay, if we're going to stay solvent, stay in business, you know, your hours can't be the same that they've always been you know? right and i i was a, a busser in high school and we sure. would they would say all right first busser come in at 4 45 right. next busser don't get here till six right and it's and you know as the busser you're like well as a kid in high school like well why why is he getting to work an extra right. hour and a half right. and, I, and i don't get that right but, i mean then he would clock out early and then i would clock out That's later right. but it was at the end of it i was able to see okay no when i got there at six it was starting to pick up and it was starting to be right. go time from and then when I would work the early shift, it wasn't near as busy, and I could handle everything by myself. Right. Or on game days, we only had one busser. Sure, you know, because everybody's going you to the game. Yeah. yeah, everybody's going. Now away games, we had two. Sure, but at home games, we only had one because everybody was at the game. And it's understanding your numbers can help you better oh, operate yeah. your business. Absolutely. I, 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 for me, I mean, it's really been the difference between um, going under and staying staying uh, and being able to thrive in, in this new environment, man. Uh, if I didn't have that training, I don't think I would have been able to uh, to launch and, and uh, stay afloat. Right, it's it's going from a, a numbers first mm-hmm. to then becoming a smoker oh, second. Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely, you know, because it, 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 it affects your inventory management mm-hmm. uh, and then you know your product delivery and everything else after that. Well, because normally, yeah, go ahead and pour, pour you some more, some JDs. Shout out to Jay to Cody. We're, What's up, Jay? We're drinking some What's of up, your baby? wine here, man. <laughs> <laughs> some Blanc de Bois. Some good shit, man. <laughs> I'm actually going to be seeing Jay this Friday for oh, a, yeah? a live bourbon tasting. We're doing a Sugarfield Spirits. My man. Um, but from a chef standpoint. Boy, love some bourbon. That he does. I think it's a certain. Yeah, there we go. Oh, oh you twist okay, it a certain all way. All right. All right. There it is. Country come to town. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> but from a chef standpoint, their general solution is to hire somebody to tell them all that. But you're com- you're like the you're the one man show. You've got yeah. the numbers, you've got the smoking experience, yeah. and, and you you're coming in with the full package. That it's not you don't necessarily need a, maybe a full time somebody to tell you your numbers because yeah. overeducated, right? You've got that education and that know how, right? And so you know, in thinking about. Um, some of the concepts associated with data science and operations management, mm-hmm. right? Um, there's this concept called the bottleneck in operations, right? And so unfortunately, I'm becoming the bottleneck because I'm a finite resource. Mm-hmm. So running the new operation and cooking for both operations and doing the data analysis and the financials and the inventory. So it is, yeah, it's a nice trait to have. However, um, I'm at a point where I have to start delegating more. And I think that's part of any entrepreneur's uh, travel, right? Is 
you know, realizing that you are a finite resource if the organization is going to move forward. You know, what does that look like from an HR standpoint? And so right. I'm, I'm trying to empower uh, the folks that on my staff to, um, to realize that they're more than just what they've done in the past. Yeah. And to also incentivize and provide opportunity for them. And that goes from that having just one location where you're able to be there every single mm-hmm. day to now having a second location, even if it's, even though it's in beta phase, you still have a second location that you now have to figure out the logistics right. of not being everywhere at the same time. Right. And for, <clears throat> for some entrepreneurs that are in their startup phase, they kind of have that tendency to hold everything close sure. to the vest. Sure. They don't want to release even the slightest task yeah. that they think is not going to be done absolutely perfect. Yeah. And it's those that struggle to get take off. That's where you see that happening yeah. is there hold everything close to the vest. I know how to do everything. I'm going to hire some people to do some of the other right. tasks that I don't want to do. But at the same time, you need to find, you know, be able to admit, all right, I can't do everything. Yeah. And I'm not the smartest person in the room at times. And that's okay. Yeah, my, my staff, uh, they have a great way of allowing me to see my foolishness. Mm-hmm. And um, I, I, I put a post out on Facebook a couple of uh, months ago where I just really had a heart-to-heart talk with the audience and said, you know, sometimes you get your butt handed to you, and this is one of those days for me. And uh, we just, you know, we just come back from COVID, and you know, the numbers weren't really where they were previously and just trying to figure out what things were. And um, there, was a, there was a sandwich that uh, Miss Gracie, our, our kitchen manager, wanted to introduce. And I was like, no, this is, this, we're a barbecue place. We're, that's our identity. We're gonna stick with that, whatever. Mm-hmm. And she came up with it and she said, hey, I really think you should try it. And by that time I was like, okay, Numbers are sucking right now, so <laughs> we'll try anything. Why not, man? We put that thing out there. It was our turnaround pole boy. We put, we put that thing out there. Oh my god, it's cocaine, man. Cocaine. <laughs> it was crack cocaine, man. I don't. I just. It blew me away at the number of people that came in because they remembered it from the old Skyhook Cafe, where she she worked for them for eleven years. Okay, and. Once social media got a hold of it, people were like, oh, God, I got to try this. Mm-hmm. And I mean, I remember when I tasted it the first time, I was like, yeah, this is stunning. Yeah, this this is a menu-worthy item. Yeah, ham, turkey, smoked pulled pork, and on that po' boy roll, dressed up the way that Miss, Miss Gracie does it. And it's, I mean, it's good about it. <laughs> I'm getting chill bumps thinking about it. Oh, it's man. Good. Um, so I want to go, we talked a little bit before the show got started about the backstory of the name Memphis Mac. Yeah. Because before you got here, I, 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 thought, I thought you so my were, name was Mac, I right? thought your name was Mac. Yeah, it's right, like right. legit. Wait, so when he got here, I said, all right, how's it going, Mac? And he's like, my name's not Mac. Nah, <laughs> it's, nah. it's not Mac. I'm like, but you okay. can call me Mac. You know, everybody, hey, Mac, hey, what's up, brother? You want some ribs? That's right. You know, you, it, there were, I respond to, hey, you, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> So Memphis Mac, um, in Memphis, uh, black exploitation culture and film um, are even still. And this is we're talking about from the early '70s. Black exploitation culture and film are still really in vogue, um, almost like a cult. But the black exploitation uh, period was a it was a period of film that um, that were made films that were made uh, in the early to mid 70s. And uh, they had a general formula where there was oppression of some black person or black community. Uh, very often there was drug, there were drugs being uh, pushed in the community and uh, a either black vigilante or someone in the, in the community would come and cast out uh, all the c- crooked cops or the drug dealers or whatever and um, it was a big smash in Hollywood for a number of years. They kept that formula and made uh, a couple of hundred black exploitation films. Uh, the Mac was one of the best known films. And so uh, I've been in barbershops where men who were f- 
functionally illiterate could recite almost half of the dialogue of this movie because they had watched it so much and had emulated the characters, right? Excuse me. Now, if you're from Memphis, uh, you grew up in the 80s and 70s like I do. You, I mean, you know this, this kind of stuff, so this is nothing new for folks there. Mm-hmm. So when I started thinking about, okay, opening up the business, I obviously wanted to I pay homage to, uh, to my hometown, but also uh, <clears throat> to make sure that we have something that would pay homage to that genre of film because I really love those films. I used to teach this class at LSU on black exploitation films. And uh, I got with a local artist, Tiffany Sewell, uh, who's done a lot of artwork here around town. And she actually designed our logo. So Goldie the pig, who has a gold tooth, you see our logo. You have to look hard. Right. He's got a gold tooth. Attention to the details. That's right. I wouldn't even have a whole grill. And they wouldn't <laughs> let me go straight ghetto. But anyway, um, Goldie, our, our pig, has a gold tooth. And uh, the, even the lettering. Uh, really harkens back to a lot of um, the, um, the, <coughs> the marketing posters for black exploitation films like Shaft, like um, Superfly and the Mac and things of that nature, man. So that's kind of um, where I got it from. Like our motto, our tagline is ribs up, bones down. Well, that is a play on an old HBO documentary called Pimps Up, Hose Down. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I don't want to, you know, I don't want to glorify that, mm-hmm. you know, prostitution, exploitation, so on right, and so right, forth. Right. But the Mac, you know, to be a Mac in Memphis is something that's you, you're cool, right? So instead of saying that, we say ribs up, bones down. Plus, that means that if your ribs go up to your mouth, they better come down with nothing but bone. Am I lying, bruh? Not lying. Okay. <laughs> so I want to I try the ribs now. All right. Um, Do your thing, bro. I'm going to eat that, but I want to listen to maybe three kind of lessons that you've gathered along the way through the teaching career, yeah. through the, the rest, I mean, your restaurant career, the barbecue career, and just some stuff you've gathered throughout your many years of doing everything you've been doing. All right. So first... Um, the first lesson I think is never take yourself too seriously. Mm-hmm. Uh, you're pretty stupid. Uh, and uh, at the end of the day, you probably probably uh, don't know as much mm-hmm. as you think you know, right? Right. Uh, the second lesson is, um, let's see, you can learn a lot from, from kids, man, young folks. Yeah. You know, I, I, I think... Uh, one of the one of the, the lessons that mm. our generation can learn. You weren't lying, Carl. <laughs> <laughs> good stuff. This is stuff. good stuff. This That's is really good stuff. good stuff. Is that uh, the generation before us very often uh, did not uh, want to share power and. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I think that's that's had some negative ramifications for our community. Uh, and let's say the third one is um, for me. Uh, listen mm. and don't talk as much. You don't need to tell Gosh, everything. It's so true. You know, sit back and, and be patient and uh, listen. Mm-hmm. You can learn so much. Yes, just by listening to somebody. You can take your time, bro. Tell their story. I'll talk for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't want you to choke. I know. I'm. Oh, this is good stuff. Good stuff, man. How can you not like pork? Oh, my God. Dude. I'm telling you. This is oh amazing. Oh, my God. So. Oh, you got to love it. Porketarian society, baby. That's right. Um, I do have a question for you, though. Sure. Memphis Mac, yet you're here in Baton Rouge. Mm. What was it that made you want to do that shift? So. You'll notice when you see our full logo, it says Memphis Mac, Louisiana barbecue. So Memphis Mac, Memphis barbecue ribs specifically known for the dry rub, right? Right. Uh, The dry rub uh, really is a, uh, an amalgamation of Mediterranean spices. Uh, We had a lot of Greek immigrants come to Memphis and 
uh, they mm. kind of started doing that and kind of kind of popularized that. So you did. <laughs> Good stuff, man. But the the Baton Rouge palate is a sweet palate, right? Mm -hmm. We're in the middle of sugar country, so it makes sense, right? We like um, our sugar cane. Absolutely, right? And so when we cook our ribs, they're cooked with that rub, right? But they're finished with brown sugar and molasses. Okay. So that's why we call it Louisiana barbecue. Like most things in Louisiana, it's a, uh, a synchronized product. It's not pure Memphis. It's got that sweet tinge to it. And that's the Louisiana, that's the Baton Rouge, Louisiana kind of um, um, addition to what I would normally make when it comes to, uh, to barbecue ribs. Now, um, my... Um, my brisket, mm -hmm. you know, most folks around here, they do it, you know, Dalmatian, salt and pepper, right? Right. And my mindset is, wait, we have all of these spices and all y'all want to use is salt and pepper? No. Louisiana, we put garlic and garlic powder and onion powder and everything else. I even use cumin in my rub for my brisket, right? So it really is... To me, Louisiana just kicks everything else up, you know. You know? And, I, and I, to me, that's that's part of the fact that we don't have what I call a waspy society. We have tinge, tinges of, of waspiness, but for the most part, I mean, we're just wide open to do what the hell we want to do around here, man. That's true. Uh, Texas is a little more conservative. They all go with the salt and pepper thing. <laughs> if you can put some more spices on there, why wouldn't you want to do that, man? Yeah, we, I mean, we like to mix it up here. Bruh, I, I like, we like I to eat turtle, a, a turtle soup. Hello? With a little sherry on it? Yes. I remember the first time I, t I tasted Tony Satchery's. Mm -hmm. I was like, what is this? Oh my God, what is this? And at that point, I'd only had like Lowry seasoning salt. Oh my God. Forget about it. So I put that on Tony. I put that on salad. Bruh. Bruh. You put it on anything. Bruh. <laughs> Listen, this is, this is no lie. So as part of my work detail in Los Angeles, I was doing some consulting work for um, LA County, their child support services. I was helping them develop an algorithm to determine who would pay child support and who wouldn't. Man, I cooked for them one time and I got like five wedding proposals. I mean, it was a mostly women environment, female environment, and they were all like, oh my God. I've never had this before and this and that. And I was like, well, first of all, I'm happily married. <laughs> and second of all, it's just in Tony's. Like, yeah. I told him, I said, guys, I, I haven't even put any smoke on this. Like, this was from a gas grill. If I had smoke on it, you'd really be going crazy, man. But we, you know, th to say all that, to say this, man, is that I don't think, oh, I know that South Louisianians don't really realize how highly revered our cuisine is, um, how we are perceived in such a positive manner outside of South Louisiana. Now we know we you know, we're ratchet and we got yeah. some stuff going on. That's right. right. We're, we're from Louisiana. Yeah, yeah. You know, we we know we're last in all the economic indicators, quality of life, whatever. That's right. But outside of here, oh man, when I tell folks I'm from Louisiana. Like, they want to engage me in conversation. It was like I was something exotic. I'm like, I'm just a dude chilling. Well, that's my, <clears throat> my dad's a civil engineer. Mm -hmm. And so he was at a meeting with some people from outside. I, I forget what country they were from, but okay. they were engineers having conversations. Sure. And he was talking about where he lived. And we, my parents live out in Sunshine, Louisiana mm -hmm. on a, you know, we live on a plantation right yeah. on the river. Yeah, yeah. And they said, wait, the Mississippi River. And my dad was like, yeah. And he was like, you've seen it? He was like, seen it? Every day. <laughs> it's like, my, my son's laid trot lines and we go catfishing mm -hmm, in it. Mm -hmm. And they are so fascinated by yeah, what man. we take for granted. Every day. We see the Mississippi River and we're like, oh, it's just, you know, it's the Mississippi River. It's just not right. a body of water. But outside of Louisiana, oh, it goes right back to what you're saying. It's stunning. It's amazing just the science and yeah. the engineering and the thought that's been put into something that we're like, and yeah, we skip rocks yeah. on it. <laughs> You know, I tell I told Jay, and I've I've been on his show a couple of times. I, every time I go on the show, Jay Ducotia, I tell him, I said, man, 
my wish is for every Louisianian to spend a month outside of Louisiana seeing and appreciating what we have here and understanding and seeing how people really revere us mm-hmm. much more so than we re- what we revere ourselves, man. Right. And it's we we have sometimes we think of where we want to go and college students want to go to a big city or something. Right, right. But outside of that and everyday way of life, now many people I talk to say, yeah, man, I wish I lived my life like in somebody in Minnesota. Sure, sure. Right, you right, know? right. But then when you go up there, they it's like you said, they spark up conversation. Oh, There's so many questions they have for us that when we when they ask them to us, we sit back, we have to think yeah. a little bit. We're like, wait. Do we really do this? Uh, it's, now, what's funny to me is how different my palate has changed since being here and since marrying my wife, who's from Lafayette, which is different from Baton Rouge. And I had no idea. Mm-hmm. I thought, okay, Louisiana is like Baton Rouge. No. <clears throat> nope. Lafayette was a whole different world. And I didn't know what the hell anybody was saying because <laughs> I could understand them. Um, but... Um, yeah, man. I mean, I the microcultures here blow me away. Mm-hmm. Even still, twenty having been here twenty years, it still fascinates me that you can have different neighborhoods and the accent and the attitudes and the whole worldview is just completely different, man. Right. It's fascinating. Oh yeah. So I'm gonna I'm gonna throw in a question for Carl. Sure. What are three <laughs> grilling slash smoking <laughs> tips? that you've learned over the years that will take an average smoker slash griller like Carl and myself and bring us to the next level using his Traeger grill and my regular propane stand-up smoker. Okay. Uh, Season chicken at least a day before. Um, He's typing this out, everybody. It it makes, in my opinion, it makes all all the difference uh, when you're cooking chicken. Um, when you're cooking your brisket, Mm -hmm. always cook it, always finish it with the fat cap up. Okay. Okay. Uh, I smoke my briskets, uh, with the lean side up for three hours and I finish it with the cap side. Uh, we season it and with, with the fat cap, um, on, uh, on top and it's just going to tenderize it and, and make it, uh, Make it very flavorful. Let's see. Um, don't. Let's see. What's, what's the, the other one? Don't think you have to buy a fancy thousand dollar device to actually get get good good uh, good barbecue. Barbecue is a couple of things: seasoning, understanding your fire, and timing. Right. It's all it is. So if you know what you're doing, you can take a trash can and a grate from your oven and make some of the best barbecue in the world. You have to understand the dynamic between the distance between the fire and the meat, the seasoning, um, smoke, and so on and so forth. Um, and so don't, don't overdo it. Uh, just uh, you know, keep it as simple as possible and uh, you know, have fun doing it, man. Yeah. You know, have fun doing it. I love I love doing a Boston butt. And I'll mm. smoke it for several hours, but then I'll take it off the pit, wrap it in aluminum foil, yeah. and then there stick it, it in an ice chest. There it is, and oh, let it let it sit for an hour and a half, two hours. I did it for a, a, a right. I did it for a buddy of mine's wedding. No pun intended. That's right, and and he he was like, okay, I want you to you know do whatever you want. I'm like, yeah. all right, God, I'm gonna smoke a Boston butt with yeah. pulled pork. And it was the first one I ever did, and I go to pull it out. I pulled out the the. Uh, ice chest mm-hmm. and i put it on i put it on my cutting board and open it up and just steam comes off oh yeah and they all just flock around oh, yeah. the table and i grab the bone and it just slides that's right it. i that's was exactly like all right i'm done it's so, good so this is this is what i want you to do the next time mm-hmm. i want you to go to costco or wherever mm-hmm. get you a boneless i go to rouse's shop local okay. only love rouse's <laughs> love rouse's man they have great to be a local store they have such great variety i right. want to try out iverstein farms okay so get why you ever been to Galen's job? I have not. Don't don't hate Bro. me, people. I have not been there yet. Bro. I need to go. Okay. Let's see. How many words is that? Three words. Green onion sausage. Just oh. just go with it. 
I Trust love, me. I love me some green onion sausage. The we make shit. We make deer and wild pork green onion sausage okay. between my my with my dad. That's what we do after and after deer season. We'll get some wild hogs yeah, that will yeah. that will harvest, oh, yeah. and we'll get some deer and we'll blend that together, and make some green onion sausage. Oh my gosh! Listen, his green onion sausage is the best I've ever had. Stunning, stunning. But this is what I want you to do. Okay. Get you a boneless mm -hmm. butt. And I want you to, it's already kind of filleted or whatever. I want you to cut down that money muscle, okay? Mm -hmm. And make it a little flatter. I want, to, I want you to get you some fresh garlic. Get your pestle or blender or whatever. Put that fresh garlic in there with some olive oil, a little bit of red wine vinegar, salt, pepper. And I want you to take that and pour that on the inside of it, all right? Mm -hmm. And I want you to roll it up, smoke it, then do exactly what you did. Put it in, wrap it up, put it in that cooler, let it steam, and tenderize. Then I want you to take it out, put it in the fridge for a day. Okay. Let it congeal, all mm -hmm. right? Unwrap it. And I want you to slice that bad boy against the grain and get you some po' boy bread. Oh. And make you some po' boys with I that. I see where this is going. Stunning. <laughs> I see where this is going. Stunning smoked garlicky goodness, man. Gosh. I know what I'm doing next with the butt mm. then. So for um to start wrapping up, uh well to wrap oh, up. Oh, is it time to go? It's it's time. We've been here a while and we could talk I need barbecue. To go to sleep. Shit, I gotta get up in the morning. That's right. That's right. I gotta get you up so you can make some some beautiful barbecue. Yes, indeed. Um, final question for you yes, is sir. what can I do to help you? Um hey folks, y'all come out to Memphis Mac. Come see us at one of our locations. Uh we're at Millennial Park. We're at uh, Larkspur Avenue, uh at the corner of Chippewa in Larkspur and uh, come see us, come patronize us, tell your friends and uh, come and come often. And what do you, so what are the, what are the days at Mark's at, yeah. uh, location so, A and location B? So our location, uh, our Larkspur location, we are open from 1030 to 230, Tuesday through Friday. And then our Millennial Park uh, operation, we are open uh, Monday through Saturday from 1130 until and when we when we get our container built out, we'll close around eight o'clock every night. Okay, so that's a longer hours of operation. Longer hours of operation, yeah. And so people can come and get their Mac on. Mac on. That's right. We do catering. Okay. Uh, we, we we definitely do catering, and um, you know we we are delivering via waiter. So hey, come see us. I love it. Yeah, man. I need to. I need to get some for like my whole office. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Feed everybody. Let us do. Pat, you got it. We'll definitely be able to accommodate you. Well, no Carlos, thank you. Thanks, Pat. For appreciate coming you, on, brother. man. I appreciate you coming on, and I Rubbing appreciate my feet and drinking all your wine. Oh, that's that's what that's what it's here for. It's to be enjoyed, and I appreciate you bringing those ribs. Oh man, well, there's plenty more. So that you was, guys enjoy. That was amazing. Share something with your wife. Does she eat meat? Oh, absolutely, okay. absolutely. Right. So, and thank you all for tuning in and listening to the episode of the podcast. I am Patty G, your host of the Patty G Show. Patty G here with Carlos from Memphis Mac. Y'all have a good one and good night.